All right, guys, I found another amazing person to be on the show to help us figure out how to field train with former best as athletes, endurance athletes specifically. And I personally am always looking for tricks to improve the aging process so I can get my running speed back and perform my best in my later years of life, my second half of life. So Dr. Jason Carp is on the show and you are just the next exit from me and we're recording here on Zoom, but welcome to the Low Carb Athlete Podcast. Thanks for having me. So you are just, I've heard of you for years. You've written gazillion books, you've articles, you're, you've been around Idea Convention and awards and races. And now we want to talk about the endurance of speed. I think training for marathons is a good time of year. This is February. A lot of people are training for a marathon. I know I've been involved with helping people at the San Diego track club doing San Diego, uh, rock and roll marathon coming up, but people around the world are always training for half and full marathons. And as we're aging, what are some secret tips have you found to improve our speed and how to do our best. <laughs> we're not, we're 40 something, 50, 60. What's different than when we're 20, 30 year olds, you just got and trained. Yeah, well, the, the reason I got the idea for the book was because I worked with a lot of marathon runners over the years and I noticed that a lot of people when they become runners as adults, you know, they, a lot of people go straight to the marathon. You know, they're enamored with the marathon and the endurance of it but they neglect their speed. They never do true speed work. And then they wonder why their marathon can't get better. And you can get faster for a marathon for a while just on the aerobic work. Like if you're a four hour marathon, you can go from four hours to three and a half hours just by doing more running. But when you really want to get much faster and, and meet your potential in the marathon, it all starts from a basis of speed. Like if you ever notice at the, the elite world-class level, most marathon runners were very, very good track and field runners before they moved up to the marathon. They spent a good portion of their career racing on the track. And then in the, the latter portion of their career, they move up to the marathon. Nobody's going the other way. No one's starting at the marathon and moving down to the track because speed is difficult to maintain over the course of one's life. But endurance is very maintainable. And, and so one trick, if you will, to become a better marathon runner is to first start from a basis of speed and work on your your pure speed and then work on the endurance of that speed to try to hold as high a fraction of that speed as possible instead of just taking the aerobic perspective all the time and logging all the miles in the long runs which is important but if you only do that then you're going to limit how fast you can run a marathon because regardless of the race you're always running at some percentage of your maximum speed and so if your maximum speed is faster then your whole marathon can get faster because you can work on maintaining a higher fraction of what becomes a faster speed and so that's what came, kind of gave me the idea for the book to to turn the traditional method of training around mm -hmm. and instead of doing the aerobic work first and then doing some speed later well later is too late to work mm -hmm. on the speed first become a fast runner first and then work on being able to maintain a high fraction of that speed for as long as possible and do the more marathon specific work later when it gets closer to the marathon. Okay, so are you starting, say tonight I was supposed to go San Diego Track Club, for example, and there's 100 and something people there and they're doing 400 meters the other week when I was there and there's different levels. There's definitely a beginner air group that they're doing just 100s instead of modifying it. So would you have a requirement before you start doing speed work, start with being able to run a mile <laughs> or three miles or how would yeah, you just well, start well, just doing sprints? Yeah, I mean, real speed work is is speed. It's not you know, mile repeats. It's nothing like that. It's it's running really fast. You know, for anything from pure speed, which is five to ten second sprints at a time, to speed endurance, which may be you know, two hundred or three hundred or four hundred meter reps. Mm -hmm. And so that's stuff that I mean, you don't need to have something to precede that. You know, if you're, if, you know, for runners who ran when they were in high school, a lot of it is fast. A lot of it is speed work initially early in the you know, athlete's career. 
happen. So, but there's nothing, no reason why you can't do that as an adult too. People get a little afraid of running fast, but that's the, the basis of all running. It's it's fast running first, and then endurance later. So you can do workouts in the first phase of your training, where you're just doing hundred meter sprints, and do you know five to ten of them in a workout, and that's the entire workout. You warm up, you do sprints, and then you do your cool down, and that's the whole workout. And you do that over the course of several weeks to months. You work on the pure speed and the speed endurance, which is the the longer sprints of something like three hundred meters or four hundred meters. And then after you do that, a phase of that, then you can move on to. You know, the, the, the two max intervals, which are more like 800 meter reps, you know, which are more aerobic in nature. And then from there, you move to the quality aerobic work, the threshold train, the tempo runs, as you also increase the, the amount of weekly mileage that you're doing. So it basically turns the traditional model of training around and does the speed, the pure speed work first, and then does the endurance work later. So we trained for years. We did kind of the Maffetone, max aerobic function, heart rate, build your base, train 180 minus your age, stay there until you're not getting faster anymore, and then do the monthly three-mile test at your math heart rate. Then that's when you should add speed work. So you're kind of reversing it and saying, okay, start with kind of almost what Tabata, we did the 20 seconds all out, 10 seconds rest, or, you know, equal that to running, doing five, 10 seconds up to 100 meter sprints that you are doing that first and then, you know, phase two, you're adding that a next layer in. Yeah. So the, the, re- the whole reason for that, again, is because you know, many adults, they, they totally neglect that. I mean, most adults, yeah. yeah, when you become an adult and you, you start running and you go right to the marathon, they, they completely neglect their pure speed. And that's uh, why they do that first, to get that out of the way first. I mean, if you look and at then you... who have been running their whole lives, you know, then they don't necessarily have to do that because they have a background of speed. You know, if you're running in middle school or high school, it's a lot of speed work done all the time. And that's why for those kinds of runners, they may not need to do that. So this method isn't for everybody. It's just for those who have no background of speed at all. And so they've never touched the fast switch fiber in their lives. You have to touch the fast switch fibers. So uh, yep. for those kinds of runners, it's very beneficial to get fast first and, and work on yeah. the slate. So it's, you know, starting with some speed work. And how long do you think people should do that phase? Is that a month long or six weeks, four to six uh, week transition? Then depends. start. It depends. I mean, in, in the book, I give it a whole long training program. The whole mm-hmm. thing is like 38 weeks long and it's broken into two halves. And the first half is working on the speed. So a lot of it depends on different factors. One factor being how quickly you adapt to that kind of work versus the aerobic kind of work. Another factor is how much it's been neglected in the past. I and mean, if you've never done any speed work before in your life, then you need to spend a decent amount of time on it to become a fast runner. Not even think about the marathon. Just become a fast runner first and mm-hmm. then focus on marathon training. I, it makes sense to me because I know I've watched people and I used to coach groups of people before I moved down here in Seattle. And you kind of, I feel like we would just, do the long, slow distance all the time. And I found this even myself as I stopped racing that you just get slower. (laughs) You just, as you age, you just get slower, not faster, but I could go long, but I just, I'm lacking that speed and power as I get older. And I used to do 312 Boston marathon and a 135 half marathons were my best time ranges. And, and now I find, you know, it's more important to do speed work and shorter workouts rather than what we used to do. And I see so many people do is just go out and do our run every day and not really right. have a purpose or a point to the the why. They're just, I need an hour. I need this much volume. Right. Yeah, we definitely lose speed as we get older. And so the speed work, the power training, that becomes even more important as we age. Because the yeah. fast switch fibers atrophy, you lose that ability to run fast in your age. Yeah, I and mean, that's a big thing as we, you know, hit 40, I, I turned 50. And now it's like, all right, as I said before, not blame the aging process, but embrace it and train differently at 50 than I would when I was 20, 30 years old. 
Right, exactly. Yeah, you can do more speed work. You have to just give yourself enough time to recover in between a faster workout. Yes. But it's very important to do that speed work. And even, you know, having strength training, anything that's going to improve power and strength because we lose that as we age. And so so we, that's a big thing but, is how much is too much because you tell that to people and they are type A driven. They're like, oh, yeah. I'm just going to do speed work every day, not – you know, do you do one speed work, two easy days, or how do you write? I mean, it's everyone yeah. needs to read your book. And yeah, so, I mean, but suggestion. All, right. So, I mean, it's all, I mean, whether you're 25 years old or 65 years old, the training principles are the same that, that you have to apply a certain amount of stress and then you let your body recover from that stress before applying greater stress. And, and so that's somewhat of an individualistic matter. You have to experiment a little bit to know how often you can do faster workouts. You know, maybe you start with just one of them a week and then you adapt to that and you habituate to that stress and then you can put in a second one per week. So, you know, that's again about the, just the, how you plan the training and what you start off with. You know, some people can handle more than others. And so you just have to know your body. You got to listen to your body. You start with a little bit of stress and then over time you increase how often that stress is applied or how much of the stress in any given workout. There's many ways that you can manipulate the stress. Now, do you like wearing heart rate monitors for people or go by speed? How would you tell, like, am I going hard enough to make it effective? That depends on the type of workout. But so for the pure speed work, you, there's no reason to have a heart rate monitor because you're going to be running at a intensity that is much faster than what your max heart rate would be anyway. But because the distance that you're sprinting is so short, you may not even reach your max heart rate, even yes. though the intensity is much higher. So leave your heart rate monitor at home for the speed work. The heart rate is really only important for the easy days, and it's important for specific kinds of workouts like tempo runs or VO2 max intervals, anything that is based based on you know, aerobic work in which you're training the cardiovascular system. So for the speed work is not important because the speed work is not about the cardiovascular system. It's about what's happening inside the muscles. Whereas the, the longer intervals or the tempo runs and the easy mileage, that's more about the cardiovascular system and uh, the ability of the muscles to use the oxygen being delivered to it. Okay, and then do you like to add in nutrition beforehand you know it's a big thing with is do you eat before workout or do you you're being more anaerobic does it you know if you want to improve performance do you fuel up or do you fasted workouts what do you think on that uh, part again that depends on the, what the workout is and what the purpose of the workout is nutrition really is more important for the longer workouts the longer runs the longer tempo runs for the speed work I mean, you could, if it makes you feel better, you could eat a couple hours before, but it, that's not where you're getting the fuel to do the workout. It's the fuel that's already inside, you know, stored inside the muscle. You know, for the short, so, for the really short sprints, yeah. you're using creatine phosphate. Becca. For the longer sprints, you're using a combination of the creatine phosphate and the blood glucose. And so that could be done first thing in the morning before breakfast because. First of all, it's not going to feel good if you run right after you eat. And secondly, when you're using what's already stored in the muscle, which isn't going to be affected by what you eat in the 30 minutes before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what, you know, the t I was telling you, the Huberman lab had the, and Dr. Andy, Ka um, what's his last name, Gappin, and on the Huberman lab podcast, talking about the benefits of doing these movement snacks, even throughout the day, doing 20 seconds, run up the stairs and just get more short bursts. And Dr. Stacy Sims talks about the SIT, short intensity interval training, more important for uh, specifically, she focused on the research for female athletes, but just how important it is to getting these all out short bursts in on a track or for runners, but any time just for general health and, and proper aging, we just need to add in those little, little snacks, snack breaks during the day. <laughs> seems like it's a hot topic to research because I think so many people get stuck in just what we learned, you know, just as endurance athletes, we need to build our aerobic base and be more of a fat burner, increase our speed at a higher heart rate that I'm still burning highest amount of fat at my set heart rate. Yeah, so. I mean, there's, there's several ways to do it. And again, it depends on what the athlete's strengths are. It depends on what the athlete's background is. 
but uh, you know, any given race, like if you want to know in a group of marathon runners who's going to run the fastest marathon, they only need to race over a couple hundred meters. If you haven't run 200 meters, and who's ever fastest over 200 meters in a group of marathon runners is also likely the fastest over the marathon because you're always running at a fraction of your speed. Like if you want to run a sub three hour marathon, but you can only run a mile at 6.30, you're never going to be able to run a sub three hour marathon because that's 6.52 pace. You can't hold 6.52 pace for an entire marathon if you can only run one mile at 6.30. So you have, at some point, you're going to have to become a faster runner if you want to keep improving even your marathon time. Yeah. So when you're doing the longer runs, you do those once a week. When you add those in, do you find like a basic program? Again, people need to read the book and get a more personalized program. I mean, again, it depends. I mean, what you do, you know, any given workout by itself means nothing by itself. It's all in the context of the entire training program and what became before it, what comes after it. It's all about the... The, uh, the, the plan that you have laid out and the direction of that plan and what that direction leads to, which is ultimately running you know, the best time you've ever run in your life. Hopefully, that's what everybody wants. And so it's all about you know, how to plan out the training and to follow the direction you want it to go. And that can be done in several different ways. There's not just one road to get there, but the road has to still make sense regardless of the road you choose. It can't just be a smattering of arbitrary workouts here and there. It has to be on a road that has a direction to it. So do you have an average number of days that people should run? Because I know some people run six days a week and others, you know, less is more philosophy and the minimal effective dose philosophy. What's What do you find kind of general yeah, yeah, principle? Again, that depends on the person, their <laughs> commitment to training, how long it takes them to recover in between run, long runs and harder workouts. And But if you're focusing on the marathon, you know, typically the more the better. And so, uh, you know, you, you know, if you take a six month marathon training plan and one has the person running six days a week and the other has the person running three days a week, well, the person running six days a week is doing twice the amount of their training within that six month period. So, you know, if you're only going to run three days a week, that's fine. But then you better choose a longer than a six month marathon training plan because six months of running three days a week is not really adequate if you're looking to run a, a solid marathon. If you're looking just mm -hmm. to finish, then that's okay. But if you're mm -hmm. looking to, to run faster than what you have before, then it's going to take longer than six months if you're running just three days a week compared to someone who's running six days a week who's doing double the amount of training. What if you're biking three days a week and running three days a week? Does that cross uh, over at all? <laughs> yeah, it all helps. But, uh, yeah, there's the specificity of training that uh, we yeah. always have to remember. And so, you know, there's a reason why the Kenyans are not the best cyclists. <laughs> uh, I mean, you can, you'll still get an aerobic benefit from doing that other stuff, but you don't get the neuromuscular benefits. You have to do the movement. You know, it's mm -hmm. like saying, well, if I practice the piano to improve my trumpet playing, well, is it going to? It, it helps, <laughs> you know, it helps in terms of more music you know you're practicing the art of of playing music but you're not practicing the specific instrument and so mm -hmm. it's the same thing with cross training you're still getting an aerobic benefit but you're not playing the specific instrument that you're going to use to race yeah so that reminds me too of if recovery because a lot of people get stuck in overtraining if they're not recovering enough for their body and you know, how do you measure if they recover or not? Do you have clients use as an aura ring or heart rate variability testing or just like I've, because a lot of people don't know if they're tired because they're yeah, high performers I mean, or overachievers. Well, a few ways you could do it. I mean, the best way is we'll do lab work. I mean, there's lots of things you can measure in your blood to tell you if you're doing too much. But apart from the, the lab work, you can look at things like your resting heart rate. And if you are really in tune with how you feel, then you can rely on the feeling and you know if you're doing too much. But like you said, a lot of people don't know if they're tired and they think, oh, we should just push through it. So they have to look at other metrics. One is the quality of sleep. You know, if you're always waking up in the middle of the night and then you're restless, you're not getting good sleep, that's a sign that something's going on. And then resting heart rate will tell you a lot. 
Yeah, I think I was testing and not guessing. What biomarkers do you like to look on a blood chemistry panel? I like to look at uh, creatine kinase, which is an enzyme that uh, only appears in the blood when there's muscle damage. And so uh, if you can measure the level of creatine kinase in the blood, that tells you if there's a lot of muscle damage. And so that tells you if the person's not recovered from harder mm -hmm. workouts. So creatine kinase is a good thing to measure. And then cortisol, of course, is a good hormone to measure. And you can look at all the hormones. Testosterone is a good hormone to measure. Yeah, that's the other question is chronic stress. So people that are are running, the clients that I get are more people that are overdoing everything. <laughs> and so we do the functional lab test investigation. But really looking at if you're training, say six, seven days a week of something, exercise, running six days, maybe active recovery day, one day off, but they're doing their workouts on top of a, a stressful life and working full time, family, relationships, you know, financial, all those other stressors externally that they have to battle. So is there, you know, find that here's the minimum we need to run to say we need six days a week running is 30 minutes. Okay. Better than like 45 minutes is optimal. Or do you have kind of ranges where we get the, some benefits? I mean, again, it's a, a lot of these questions and the answer is it depends. And it depends yeah. on what the person's background is, what their goals are, how much they can handle, how much time they have to run. You know, because while somebody who's training to run a 230 marathon, maybe 30 minutes of running is not going to be enough for them. But someone who's trained to run a four and a half hour marathon, 30 minutes may very well be enough for them to get the same stimulus. So it all depends on the, the level of stimulus and what they're trying to accomplish and how much time they have to do it so they can get the most at the least amount of work. I mean, that's where the whole high intensity aspect has come in, you know, especially in the fitness industry, is trying to get the most at the least amount of time. And that's why the high intensity training has become so popular because in a 20 minute workout, you can get an amazing workout if it's high intensity. And so, what my recommendation is that the less often that people run, then the more important each day of training becomes. And so that's why, like, if you're going to have a three-day-a-week training plan, then each of those three days has to be of high quality. Because if they're a low intensity just for the three days, then it's going to take a very long time to get fit. It's going to take much longer than a six-month training plan. But if those three days are of a higher quality, then it can be done in that six-month time frame. So it all depends on how much running the person's doing and how you manipulate the volume versus the intensity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other question is, you know, you had a great post about how do you adapt to training and aerobic exercise and resistance training? How, how much is resistance training important in a, in the program? Well, again, that depends, but you know, I've <laughs> kind of become uh, been a little bit outspoken about the effects of strength training on distance running performance and, and uh, over the years, I've had to qualify what I've said so that people understand because it's not that I'm against strength training. It's just that there's very little that specific strength training can do for someone that certain kinds of running can't do. Like the best type of strength training for a distance runner is probably running hills. Do short, fast hills to work on speed and power, and then do longer hills to work on the cardiovascular development. I mean, there's a reason why most VO2 max tests done in the lab incorporate a hill on the treadmill. Because when you run up a hill, you're engaging more muscle mass, you drive the heart rate up, and you consume more oxygen. So it can improve VO2 max. And so going into a gym and doing the traditional kinds of lifting and you know, doing squats and lunges and that kind of stuff is not going to make someone hold a faster pace in a race that takes three hours or four hours. There's more training, there's more specific running training that the person can do. They can increase their volume, they can increase their intensity, they can increase their volume of intensity, they can run hills, they can do the pure fast speed work. There's a lot of things that people can do that have more direct carryover or translation into being able to hold a faster pace for a marathon than going to the gym and, and doing the squats and the lunges and the burpees and all that kind of stuff. So what it would you include the, doing foundational work in there? Is doing planks and side planks and glute activity, act, 
active muscle activation for your glutes and balance exercises, things like that to help. Yeah, you can do that stuff by running too. You can do bounding yeah. trails up the hill. Yeah. You, know, you can mm -hmm. do lunging. You can do like jumping lunges up a hill. So and that's going to activate the glute. Whoever doesn't think that hill running works your glutes, you go and sprint up a hill 10 times and you're yeah. going to be sore the next day. So there's a lot that you can do with running, which is obviously much more specific to the act of running because you're running doing these different kinds of things than to do you know, the stationary kinds of exercises that have no translation to the actual running. I mean, the big thing yes. about running and strength trains, like when you go into a gym and you're doing squats or deadlifts, your foot is in contact with the ground the entire time you're doing the lift. And so you're getting used to applying force to the ground the entire time. When you run, your foot is only in contact with the ground for a fraction of one second. When you're running easy, it may be about three or four tenths of a second. When you're running faster, it's about two tenths of a second. And so if you want to become a faster runner, you have to get used to applying force to the ground in a very short amount of time because that's what you're going to do when you're running. You don't have the foot in contact with the ground for five or ten seconds on each step. But that's the way it is when you're in a gym doing these exercises. So that's why it doesn't carry over because you have mm -hmm. to be able to produce a lot of force against the ground very quickly. And that's the definition of power. It's the rate of force development. That's what needs to be trained more than anything else. That's why I like my, I did it this morning, Tory Pines, my workout up oh, there. That's yeah, a perfect yeah. pitch. <laughs> Tory Pines is a great hill, yeah. Yeah, I love doing intervals on there. It's my best spot. And that's where I do feel like, you know, what do you think of downhill running to work on turnover speaks? That's yeah. what I always felt made a biggest bang for the buck. Yeah, downhill uphill, downhill. Running. You got to be careful with that because there's a lot of eccentric contractions and causes a lot of soreness. But if you can find, you know, maybe something on grass that's not as hard on the legs. If you can find just a slight downhill slope and do sprints downhill, that's also very, very effective for improving speed. But just you got to be careful Give doing it only small doses because yeah. it causes a lot of muscle damage and uh, you'll be sore for a couple of days afterwards. <laughs> I'm laughing because I had flashbacks. One year I did ski to sea relay race in Bellingham, Washington, and I had the eight mile downhill leg was my event I had to do eight miles from Mount Baker all the way Ooh. down to the river for the kayaker. <laughs> I've never ever been that sore and I've done 15 Ironmans and how many Boston marathons and run all sort races, but nothing like eight miles downhill it was killer. <laughs> that is killer. Yeah. There's so much muscle damage. Eight miles is a long way to go downhill. Oh, it was horrible. <laughs> yeah. People think, oh, it's easy, it's downhill, but, but no. uh, yeah, your legs are going to be screaming at you. Yeah, and then even, you know, I used to do Boston Marathon for years, and I'd out, we'd always laugh at the people going down the stairs at the restaurant the next day, you know, yeah. or that night, and just no one could walk, I guess it would be the next day, just that post-marathon of Boston, mm -hmm. because then I learned how to train for Boston, because it's uphill, downhill, and then I never had problems, but it is funny watching people. So the other question is not a big topic. You know, my male athletes are sick of it, but what, how should men train differently than the female athlete? It's a very good question. Something I've been fascinated by for uh, quite a long time, which I led to the writing of Running for Women. And then in one of my latest books, Running Periodization, I included a whole chapter on menstrual cycle periodization. So uh, the better way to phrase the question is uh, not how men should train differently than women, but how should women train differently than men? <laughs> And uh, there's a whole uh, art and science to that, and how women should schedule their training around their menstrual cycle. It's quite fascinating. Um, I could speak for a whole hour on that, but, but the, uh, the short of it is that estrogen is a runner-friendly hormone, and progesterone counteracts a lot of the effects of estrogen. And so times of the month when estrogen is high, so estrogen is rising the entire first two weeks of the menstrual cycle and peaks right before day 15 on ovulation. And that's a good time to push the aerobic work, to increase the, the aerobic mileage, to do the long tempo runs. That's a great time to do the aerobic work. And then when 
the opposite. When progesterone is high, that's a good time to back off, either to maintain what you're doing or to back off a little bit on the training rather than to try to push the endurance work. Because progesterone does a few things that make, especially long endurance work, more difficult. It increases body temperature, it increases breathing, and so people can, uh, you know, women can perceive those workouts during that time of the month as to be harder because a lot of times we uh, link how hard we're working to how hard we're breathing. And so because progesterone increases breathing and it increases body temperature, especially if it's hot and humid outside, it makes those efforts more difficult. But estrogen is a great time to really push the aerobic work because estrogen helps with endurance. It shifts metabolism toward a greater reliance on fat at the same pace. So we already know that, that women rely more on fat and less on carbohydrate when running at the, the same absolute pace and even relative pace compared to a man. And that seems to be a, a result of the increased estrogen. There's been a lot of research done on rats looking at this and you get male rats estrogen. And you know, this kind of research is interesting. It's a little bit unethical to do this on humans because you know, where are you going to find men who want to be injected with estrogen? But we can do this kind of stuff on, on rodents and rats. And, and so that's what the research has found, that when you give male rats, you know, they test them before they give them the estrogen and then after, and they find that, uh, that there's a shift in metabolism toward a greater reliance on fat under the influence of estrogen. What we don't know is how that estrogen is, is changing metabolism to, to make the muscles rely more on fat, what the mechanism is behind that. We don't know that mm -hmm. yet, but we do know that estrogen affects metabolism in such a way that you're relying more on fat and less on carbohydrate. And so you're conserving the limited store of carbohydrate because we, we have unlimited stores of fat, but we have a very limited store of carbohydrate. And so if you notice at the, at the elite level, the difference in performance between men and women from the 100 meters up to the marathon is about 10%. So that shrinks to about 5% when you look at ultra marathons. And sometimes women are beating the men and even winning the race outright, even beating all of the men in ultra marathons. So there's much less of a difference in endurance performance the longer the race gets. And that has a lot to do with relying more on fat because in these longer races, you want to rely more on fat than, as long as you can because once you use up your limited store of carbohydrate, you're going to be in trouble. So uh, that's why women, that's one of the reasons why women are really good at very, very long distance events because of their greater reliance on fat. Yep. No, I could go endurance sport was easy for me. I just could go and go. <laughs> then my husband doesn't like doing the long stuff. He's like, ah, oh, I'm good. I can go have coffee and go home. Yeah, if you take a cross section of the population, most women are better the longer the race. I mean, of course there are women, you look at the elite level, the professional level, there are female sprinters too, who are phenomenal. You look at someone like Sydney McLaughlin, the 400 meter hurdles, she's phenomenal. But they're also self-selected because they're the outliers of society. Yeah. If you take a cross section, you look at the entire population, most women, fare better the longer the race because of the effects of estrogen. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, we've talked a lot about that. I always find it fascinating. I created Training Peaks program for clients that I can apply to them based on day one of their cycle. So I can really dial it in, all this information. It's pretty cool. Okay, so running economy is a big thing. And I've been into metabolic testing and then and the, just reading today, actually, or watching a seminar on how breathing can impact our performance as well. So anything on running economy that how we can improve our ability to run, how we're, I think, postural too, and how people breathe, anything on that, we could throw in some few tips. Yeah, there's a few things. I mean, running economy, out of the three big physiological factors that influence performance, economy gets the least amount of attention. Most of the attention is on VO2 max and lactate threshold, but economy is probably the most important of the three because it represents how hard you're working at a given percentage of your maximum. And so the definition of running economy is how much oxygen you're using to maintain a given submaximal running speed. And so while VO2 max represents the maximum volume of oxygen, running economy is what the VO2 is, the volume of oxygen at something submaximal, whether it's seven minute pace or eight minute pace or nine minute mile pace. 
And when you go out the door to run at any given pace, you're going to consume a specific amount of oxygen to maintain that pace. And the less oxygen that you use to maintain that pace, the more economical you are and the faster you're going to be able to run at a given percentage of your max. So it's very, very important. Mar the really good marathoners tend to be extremely economical, and that's why they're able to run at such a high fraction of their maximum speed. And so there's a few different ways you can improve running economy. The, the most obvious one is run a lot. And that's just like anything else. Like... Um, you know, if you want to practice playing the piano, you know, at first when you start playing the piano, you're very uneconomical. You're thinking about where your fingers are supposed to go on the keyboard, and it takes a long time to to remember that, oh, i got to hit this key, then i got to hit that key. But then you practice over and over and over again, and after many months or years of practicing, you're not even thinking about where your fingers have to go. They just automatically go because it's a central nervous system recruitment of the muscles to make your fingers go there and so it's the same thing with running that when you first start running you're very uneconomical but it's very responsive to training because you're practicing that movement over and over and over and over again hundreds of thousands of times and so that's one way to improve economy is just to do the physical act of moving the legs over and over and over again and practicing mm -hmm. the skill of running Mm -hmm. Another way, you know, I posted something today actually talking about the Achilles tendon. You know, the Achilles tendon, when it's used correctly, acts like a spring to propel you forward. And so the, the more that you can rely on the Achilles tendon to propel you forward with each step, the less the muscle, the less work the muscles have to do. Because the more work the muscles have to do, the more oxygen it costs. And the more oxygen it costs, the worse the economy. So one way to improve economy is also to maximize the ability for the Achilles tendon to store and utilize elastic energy with each step. And that can be done several ways. That can be done with plyometric training. That can be done with hill running. That can be done with working on your posture so that you're landing in the correct posture to, mm -hmm. to activate that Achilles tendon and, and have it work as much like a spring as possible. So there's several things that you can do to enhance the ability of the Achilles tendon to do its job to take the work off the muscles, and that'll improve economy because that decreases the amount of oxygen that you need to advance yourself a given distance with each step. Hmm. That makes sense. So it sounds like we don't need to go to the gym. Our gym's outside. <laughs> go find some stairs, some hills, or a track, or ideally both because you need hills. And you know, just get out there. So a lot of people don't have hills where they live. So maybe they find stairs is a good stair repeats. Does that help? Yeah, yeah stairs can work very well. Uh, treadmill, you can set the, you can manipulate the hill of the treadmill, anything you want. You know, heavy strength training has actually also been shown to improve economy. But again, to have that translate into holding a faster pace in a race, it's not so much because, again, you're not working on, you know, keeping your foot in contact with the ground for only a couple of tenths of a second, and that's an important thing to train. So would you suggest doing shorter races, a lot of 5Ks that are around? Because I know we've got the kook run this Sunday I'm doing, and there's, like, I saw you did the Valentine's run last weekend, which I didn't have on my list. And there seems like, especially San Diego, living here for two years, it's like, now, post-COVID, there's race every weekend. <laughs> so race, race yourself in a shape. <laughs> yeah, that is one strategy. I mean, certainly when you're working on the speed phase of your training, you should also match that with doing much shorter races. If the races themselves act as speed work. So, yes, if, you, if your goal is to run a faster marathon, then, yes, I would say also run a lot of shorter races to help make yourself faster. Or maybe run, walk in the 5K race, so sprint and then walk and sprint, yeah. rock. <laughs> sure, you can use it as a workout. Yeah. Well, not, not these days, when I started, I don't know, 25 years ago, it would be $30 to register for a race. Now they're $110 to register for a 5K or 10K. They're so expensive. So I used to do that. But nowadays, it's like, oh, am I going to make a good effort and push myself and feel good? Or am I going to just jog it? I'm not going to pay the money. <laughs> 
half you know, acid. When I was growing up, braces were very cheap. And now, I, look, you know, I think you're paying for all the things that, uh, you know, it's all the food after the race. It's, you know, now everybody gets a medal. So whoever puts on the race, <laughs> they have to pay for all these medals. So some of these women have to pay for thousands and thousands of medals. And so, you know, people are paying for that. They think that they get a free medal, but then it's not free. They're, they're, yeah. That's why the race, that's why it costs uh, 50, 60 bucks to race a 5K because you're paying for the medal, you're paying for the food. Yeah, I saw the medal for the San Diego St. Patrick's Day dash, and it's like you did Iron Man. <laughs> Here, you just did a 5K race, and a lot of the people are probably drinking beer beforehand, but you get this big medal. <laughs> Everyone's right. a winner. That's right. Yeah. When I was growing okay. up, I mean, you had to actually win the medal, and they had trophies, and now everybody, everyone's treated as a winner. Yeah, the same with kids sports, I heard, too. I don't have kids, but I heard every everyone gets a ribbon. <laughs> So I guess it's good sometimes. So where can people find you? You've got so many books. Is it best to go to your website, Amazon, bookstores? Yeah, all my books are on Amazon. They're all on my website as well. And uh, website's easy to remember. It's just drjasonclark.com. And yeah, I'm mean, excited about this this latest book, Endurance of Speed. I think it's going to be a yeah. game changer because it's something that, as I say in the book, you know, people not often. They often don't get faster, not because of what they do, but because of what they don't do. And one of the things that they don't do is to get fast and do the, the fast speed work first before working on the endurance of speed. Well, that's why it caught my eye because I've been feeling that way myself for my own performance. Like my body knows how to go long and slow. I've done that for 25 years. Now it doesn't know how to go fast and push it and go 20 seconds, 30 seconds all out. I don't know how to go hard. So as a retired Ironman marathon 50k runner <laughs> who can go forever for a skump, now it's like, all right, speed. I need to actually learn how to go fast and have some power and just push it because you yeah. don't know how to go hard. You know, go to zone five or whatever you want to call it. It's like to get out of breath yeah. is a whole different thing than go yeah. slow and easy. Right. I can talk <laughs> easy, but to go hard is hard. Yeah. It's like imagine when you rode your trap on bike, if you only rode in one gear all the time. Mm -hmm. You gotta think of that with running. You, know, you gotta work all the gears when you run so yeah. that you have all the gears available to you when it's time to race. True. Well, that's why I tell people you gotta have a purpose to your run because so many people do the same old run. I've said this for years. They do the same route, just run their five miles and they just didn't have a rhyme or reason to what they're trying to get out of that run. So I think right. this is you know, a good book for people to read to flip the pyramid around and train differently because I think as we look at the benefits of more of the short intense interval training for aging female athletes and for male athletes, I think that really helps combine when we, you know, add the endurance training, but it makes sense with all the other research we hear out there for aging and performance in life. So yeah, good sure. idea. Good book. Yeah. Okay. So everyone go to Jason Carp or is it Dr. Jason Carp.com? Yeah, okay. And there, you've got so many books. So start with this one. Is there kind of one people sh should read to get more information or where to start? Well, I think the endurance of speed is something if they want to improve their marathon or stuck. I think the endurance of speed is something that's going to get them unstuck. But if they want to also read a book that uh, maybe was my favorite one to write, which talks more about the holistic side of running and how running helps you become a better person and deal with discomfort than uh, read the, the inner runner. Ooh, that'd be a good one. Yeah. Well, you should come speak at the San Diego tri club. They have monthly meetings. You should, oh, I should get you be a speaker. Mark oh, Allen's yeah. Yeah, that'd speaking be this month. Yeah, so awesome. reach out. Yeah. Well, thanks for your time today. Great information. So much more on your social media posts. And definitely look at your website and get those books because I think we're endurance athletes looking to get faster, but we're all aging up. So any different way to train, as I say every time, what's the definition of insanity? <laughs> Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. So mixing it up and trying something new is probably what most people need to do. <laughs> They're stuck.